on again and welcome. Firstly, I'd like to uh, thank you for registering your interest in this, Genscape's first maritime freight webinar. My name is Simon Toyne, and I'm here with my Genscape colleague, Adam Barnes. Uh, we're together with Matthew McDwyer. Matthew is the uh, CEO of Commodity Vectors, which is a strategic partner of Genscape in our maritime product development. For anyone not completely familiar with Genscape, we are the leading global provider of energy information for the commodity and financial markets. The Genscape team utilizes patented technologies and proprietary algorithms to provide accurate and timely data on capacities, flow, and utilization for all major energy commodities. These include power, natural gas, oil, NGL, and petrochemicals. And most recently, we moved into the maritime space. Genscape's vast data network delivers exceptional insight and competitive advantage to our clients. In today's webinar, we will explain and demonstrate the distinct advantages of Genscape's maritime vessel tracking capabilities, and Matthew will be introducing Commodity Vector's exciting new and unique global LNG monitor. So, just before Adam begins, can I draw your attention to the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your webinar screen? You can post your questions here, and we'll be happy to address them at the end of the presentation. I'll now hand over to Adam to begin the presentation. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everybody. So before we get into it, I wanted to share uh, some of the buzz we're hearing in the industry. Time and again, we hear our clients highlight the quality, cleanliness, and accuracy of our maritime data, as pictured on this slide. I can easily import the data directly into our in-house models. We could see more of the ships more of the time. Now, there's a lot of infrastructure that takes place to make this happen, and we're going to get into that soon. But the end benefit is that we deliver total global transparency on the 100,000 plus ocean going fleet. In addition to the broadest global coverage and data quality, we also offer a number of formats for our clients to easily absorb this information into their in-house uh, shops and models. So with that, let's begin. So there are over 10,000 ships exceeding 300 gross tons navigating the oceans between 10,000 ports worldwide. The sheer size of the potential data set requires technology to assist in collating, organizing, and evaluating. And this is exactly what Genscape has been doing for nearly a decade through the Vessel Tracker systems, enabling our clients to make critical business decisions in near real time. As you can see from this slide, we have various services and delivery methods, which are at the center of our client's workflow. And what really impresses me is that when we look at our tailored solutions, the fact that your IT or development team can speak directly to our developers, ensuring that your vision is realized, thus a smooth and painless integration into your in-house systems, enriching our data with your proprietary information. With the ability to set monitoring zones and alerts means you don't have to be logged into our systems for our systems to work for you. Let's take an example. Uh, the Blue Pearl changes her ETA deep ocean. Within seconds, this intelligence will be delivered to you in your preferred media. Now, Genscape has formed uh, various strategic partnerships with clients such as Exact Earth and Commodity Vectors. And through this presentation, we'll explain how these strategic partnerships benefit our clients. Now, I've been in the industry for over a decade, and I've even worked for competing AIS providers. However, the infrastructure and quality of the Genscape offering is second to none. Now, this really is apparent uh, when we look at the two important factors when consuming AIS data, uh, these being revisit and latency. 
uh, revisit. Now, today I'm not going to go into technical specifications. However, needless to say, uh, with our exclusive relationship with Exact Earth, who are the world's largest AIS provider, gives our clients an unprecedented view of the global fleet as we receive more individual positions within a 24-hour period. Therefore, our clients can make informed decisions and, and mitigate risk. When we look at latency, uh, having the world's largest constellation of satellites and largest terrestrial network, coupled with our strategically positioned base uh, data processing centers, enables uh, Genscape to deliver faster, cleaner data. And to, together with our patent clean data AIS deep collision technology, which filters bad data from good, gives our clients the ability to accurately see, see more ships more of the time. Now we build up the world's largest private AIS antenna network with deployments in emerging markets, for example India, where close to poor AIS networks have needed expansion. This is critical in our ability to provide the best close to port coastal analytics possible. Now it's fair to say in the AI space coverage is king. Genscape and Exact Earth cover more of the world's ocean and our network is still growing. On average we add 20 new stations per month to our terrestrial network in key locations and Exact Earth will add another two satellites to their constellation in 2014. It is this combination of satellites and on the ground antennas allows Genscape's clients to identify more trading opportunities. And with that being said, I'd like to show you a few scenarios. Now the challenge to our customers has been how to create new trading opportunities. As stated, the potential size of these data sets can become overwhelming. And the additional challenge was how to filter out unwanted information. Therefore, AIS data on its own is not always enough. It's critical to have a supporting data to make sense of what you're looking at. To support that, you need a solid reference data set. We have built up our extensive vessel database, which enables us to help our clients slice and dice AIS information in various ways to support their workflow. Introduced in 2006 with our terrestrial AIS network, which really changed the transparency of the maritime industry as traders were able to track vessels in near real time. However, due to the technology being used, there were large periods of time where no one knew for certain exactly where individual vessels or entire ship types were. Now the game really changed in 2010 with the introduction of Exact Earth and their low orbit satellites. However, AIS satellites was not and still not the answer to our customers' challenges. Therefore the marriage of the two systems were formed, offering our clients an unprecedented view of the global commodities regardless of location. As a result, in using this market-leading AIS intelligence gave our clients the ability to access live information on change of destination, thus increasing the competitive edge of the trading desk. As not only could we see the destination from the AIS message, but by the ship's GPS itself, can visualize and quantify disruptions at port facilities caused by anything from geopolitical unrest to inclement weather. Aggregate the flows of imports into any port, region or country. The ability to track competitors and understand market opportunities. Ultimately it's basing trading decisions on market intelligence and not speculation. Um, with that I'm going to pass back over to Simon who's going to run through a few more scenarios. Simon. Yeah, thanks Adam. Um, as Adam has clearly explained, 
Genscape's superior AAS coverage um, is, is uh, a tremendous opportunity for everybody. And um, by example, we should consider India again. Um, as we all know, India is the largest commodity import-export market in the world. It has a, a number of key ports and very heavy marine traffic. Previously, though, it suffered from extremely poor AIS antenna coverage. Today, however, Genscope's antenna network is comprehensive in the region. This tremendous coverage allows users to zero in to all Indian ports of interest. In this case, on the slide, it's Mumbai. This ability allows for all port movements to be monitored in near real time, even in these congested but commercially critical waters. And considering decision making. Why would we make any marine operational decisions based on scanty third party information? Genscape's vessel tracking capabilities allows the users to monitor port congestion, uh, congestion in near real time. In this case, we can see Santos in Brazil. This ability allows suppliers, ship owners, and or receivers to make logistical decisions based on hard facts, not scanty information. Clearly, securing revenues and or reducing costs are far better controlled with the aid of Genscape's vessel tracking intelligence. So, uh, if Adam can summarize the AS data, please. Thanks, Adam. So, if I can, I'd like to put all this into perspective. Within a four day window, we currently track 92% of the tanker and 94% of the dry bulk fleet. And these figures don't even take into account vessels that are laid up or awaiting instructions. As previously discussed, Genscape has and still is investing in the growth of both our AIS network and infrastructure to ensure that we're ahead of the curve when it comes to realizing our customers' visions. The fact that we own our own network means that we can monitor and resolve most connectivity matters to ensure that we continue to deliver the best and cleanest AIS information. Ultimately, what does this mean to you? Well, it means you get the right data to the right people at the right time, allowing you to get on with what you do best, which is profitable trading. With that, I would like to pass over to Matthew McDwyer from Commodity Vectors. Thank you, Adam. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew McDwyer, and I am the CEO of Commodity Vectors. So we're a London and Dublin-based company specializing in the further analysis of AIS data to provide additional tradable intelligence to the market. Now, as Simon mentioned earlier, we are a strategic partner of Genscape, and it is our joint intention to create data providing a complete and seamless picture of the global energy logistics chain. Now, you've just heard about Vessel Tracker's world-beating AIS uh, data collection and management systems. I've used several AIS sources in my work, and their antenna and satellite coverage uh, is second to none. But I'm going to talk to you a little about the gap that still exists between this data and comprehensive market-wide understanding of the various maritime flows in bulk commodities. Now, our first offering to the market is uh, real-time analysis of the global LNG market. This is the smallest self-contained fleet of ships and facilities, which has greatly reduced the complexity of the calculations. I should start by saying that there exists fundamental issues, both technical and operational, with AIS data, which makes it difficult to rely solely on the data as a proxy for cargo uh, movements. Now, these is issues are not due to the data collector, but are rather limitations around the technology used and its implementation. I guess the first issue is that vessels go missing a lot, um, either due to the relatively weak VHF signals used, uh, which are susceptible to atmospheric variations and interference from other traffic, or as a result of the master turning off his transponder, for which there is ample anecdotal evidence, it is not possible to see every vessel all of the time. Secondly, even in ports which are well covered with antennas like, for example, Rotterdam, vessels occasionally manage to move in, complete their operation, and leave without being detected within the port limits. 
Now, obviously, this means that any simple system which may count vessels entering defined areas such as ports or terminals or berths is, while a good proxy, it's subject to an unknown level of variation. And the solution until now has been to essentially hand track uh, entire groups of ships, or indeed entire fleets, such as the LNG fleet, to produce this fleet-wide estimation or aggregate of operations, including on seam port operations and, and potential destinations. This takes a lot of time and needs substantial resource. However, this is fundamentally what the commodity vectors algorithms are designed to do. So regardless of whether a vessel is currently seen or not, uh, or if it completes an unseen port operation, we have a solution, and by that I mean a most likely voyage and cargo for every vessel in the fleet in real time. On this slide, we illustrate the vessels seen at any one time by satellite and antenna pickup, and how they're being augmented in purple uh, by the commodity vector solutions for vessels not recently seen. The second issue with, it, with the AIS data is that while masters have the option, and it is an option, of entering destination, draft, and ETA information uh, into their transmission, with the exception of certain areas such as the Japanese home waters, they're not required to. They often enter their next waypoints, or sometimes nothing at all, or, or random rubbish. Similarly, with their draft transmission, which, if correct, can provide a reasonable idea about how laden the vessel is, it's quite common to see vessels happily sailing around the world, never changing their draft transmission from, for example, the maximum draft of the boat. It's plain that there are a number of vessels, quite a large number of vessels, whose owners simply do not want the market as a whole to know where they may be going or what they may be carrying. However, again, surprise, surprise, Commodity Vectors has the answer. Uh, found within the realms of statistical analysis, we're able to provide a likely final port of call based on a host of factors. Uh, the operation that's likely to take place there, and the amount of cargo, and indeed what, what the actual cargo is on the boat. And as already mentioned, these answers are available regardless of whether the ship has been last seen three minutes ago or three weeks ago, and they're available in real time. In summary, we've created as our base layer of information a voyage for each vessel rather than a position. And this allows sensible and complete, or as complete as information allows, fleet-wide aggregates and other analysis. The LNG fleet, for example, is just under 400 ships strong. Uh, and by watching AIS data at any one time, so between satellite and uh, antenna data, uh, you will have a reasonable answer for 300 or thereabouts of these ships. However, any statistics derived from this information is going to be missing 20, 25, 30% of the market at that one time. So unless you have a holistic solution for the entire fleet, um, you're going to be missing an unknown amount of variation. I've got a few examples here. Um, I'm going to start with a very simple one and a very common one in the LNG world, which is uh, the passage, in this case, of a Qatari gas carrier uh, sailing from an almost certain discharge in the UK back to Ras to load another cargo. Uh, the graphic shows quite clearly, I hope, uh, where the boat is seen, uh, i.e. Uh, transmissions are being picked up in, in a live fashion, uh, and unseen uh, by AIS. Now, one of the difficulties in using AIS to perform analysis is that this pattern of seen and unseen areas, so whether using coastal, satellite, coastal antennas or satellites or the two combined, is unlikely to be exactly the same even two days later when another Qatari vessel comes back from the UK. However, in this example, it's relatively straightforward because the relative, the respective port events, meaning the entry and exit from Milford Haven and uh, Ras Le Fan, were, um, were observed by the uh, AIS transmission. Uh, and the disappearances between, uh, of the vessel at sea uh, didn't allow for uh, any other operations. So this is relatively easy. If I look at the second case study, though, this is more interesting. And what we're looking at is another Qatari gas carrier sailing from Ras Le Fan, and this time it's going to Canaport in Canada. Now, in this example, the vessel's entry and exit to and from Canaport were not observed by AIS. In fact, in this case, the vessel was not seen from the Azores onward going west. Um, but by using predictive solutions available before the vessel disappeared and reverse checks when it's next seen returning to Qatar, Commodity Vectors is able to compute that the vessel went to Canaport arriving at a certain time on a certain day and delivering a certain amount of cargo. <clears throat> Just as a note here, although I th uh, the resolu at this resolution the line across the Atlantic looks fairly solid, it is in fact an unseen segment of the voyage from the Azores through to Canada. However, just to finish off on this slide, I want to say that every vessel in the fleet, and for every vessel in the fleet, we have a complete operational history based on these predictive systems to fill in the gaps, as well as, of course, the uh, live solution for her current voyage and action. 
So in summary, we provide this additional layer of analytics atop AIS position data, which interprets the data in much the same way as human hand tracking would interpret the data, and which produces uh, voyages and cargoes for an entire fleet, uh, whether they're currently visible or not. Um, our first product is in the LNG space, uh, and we expect to launch a coal platform in 2014. Um, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. Um, well, thank you, uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Adam. Um, but I'm afraid you can't relax just yet, um, as uh, I've actually received quite a, quite a few questions from from the audience. Um, and the first one is um, uh, here we go. How does the LNG system decide that a ship went into a certain port when it wasn't observed? Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, well, the answer is, is found in, in, in using probabilistic solutions rather than hard and fast if-then statements. So there's a number of uh, analysis systems looking at AIS data in the market, as I'm sure you're, most, you're all aware. Um, but they're all using systems which say if a ship is seen in this position, then this action is taking place, and if it's seen in that, then that action is taking place. And this doesn't allow for the almost chaotic um, <coughs> movements of vessels at sea. So they're they're very chaotic, constrained only really to try and load, and load somewhere and discharge somewhere else. Um, so in, in, our, in our system, uh, there's no one piece of evidence required for a decision to be made. Rather, all information uh, and all the possible solutions at any one time uh, for the vessel, uh, both current and historical, are analyzed to produce the most statistically accurate solution. Uh, however, I guess in, in a, a very short answer would be to say that uh, we would use such tests as the best course uh, calculated and learning several learning decision trees over time. And we input these into a, um, a collapsing probability structure to, to determine where, what the most likely thing the vessel is doing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Matt. Um, another question here, which I think is also for you, Matt. Um, do you have trajectory predictions based on AIS data? Thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, uh, the, the trajectory of vessels uh, is, is, is obviously one of the inputs to, to what we're doing. Um, our systems learn, uh, they both, we, we both have calculated project, uh, trajectories, but they also learn trajectories over time so that as uh, local events perhaps may, may, may change the course of vessels over time, etc., our system will learn that, uh, that this change is taking place and, and adjust the most likely future destination accordingly. So we have both calculated and learned uh, trajectories. Okay, thanks for that, Matt. Um, right, and another question here. Um, what historical AAS data do you hold and how far back does it reach? Alan. Thanks, Simon. Um, so what's unique about ourselves uh, from the beginning of this year is we don't throw away any data whatsoever. So from the beginning of the year, so beginning of January, we can play back in real time every single AS message that we got. So let, let's take an example of that. So there was an incident, uh, two vessels collide. We can play that back in real time, both of those vessels, um, which nobody else in the marketplace can do. Uh, prior to that, uh, again, yes, we store information. We can go back to 2006 with our historical data. And again, uh, as we said, we can slice and dice that information up to however the client wants to see it, whether it's on individual vessels, uh, on port callings, or in entire um, fleets uh, or vessel types. Okay, that's great. Well, perhaps that leads into another question here, Adam. Um, what are the computational limitations for a larger amount of ships, i.e. thousands? Okay, so th this is really where the satellite and the terrestrial network come into their own, um, and they need to be fused together. When you're close to shore, the satellite information, um, there is some data uh, collision. Uh, because we're looking at VHF information, it will pick up all VHF, uh, whether it be a taxi signal or uh, an AIS message. So that is why you need a terrestrial network to get rid of 
all that background noise and just capture the AIS because they're physically tuned into that signal to, to capture that. So when you fuse the two together, you've got the satellite picking up all the vessels in deep ocean. It doesn't have that uh, issue with regards to the VHF because in the ocean there is no such uh, confusion. So by fusing the two together, we can pick up individual vessel, we can pick up thousands of vessels. Um, with the technology we've got, we can then consume all that information, either let clients come in and, and pull the data on an individual level or uh, at a fleet level as well. Um, and again, just to put that in context, you know, we see tens of thousands uh, of vessels within our network every single day. Um, I think the, the number's getting close to 90,000 vessels in, in any one time. So the ability to consume that amount of data is our day-to-day -day business. Okay, thanks for that, Adam. Um, right, one more for you while you're there. Um, do you own all of the AIS data, or do you have other providers? Well, that's a great question. So, as we said earlier, we have uh, built up strategic partnerships. So our terrestrial information um, is our information, and then we work in conjunction with our strategic partner, Exact Earth and we are a reseller of that information. So we fuse their data uh, with ours to give that uh, global view. So the answer to the question is yes, we, we own the, the data um, and we have strategic relationships with third parties to provide that information into the marketplace. Okay, thanks for that, Adam. Uh, Matt, how does the LNG system decide that a ship went into a certain port when it wasn't observed. Simon, so, thanks. I think we've answered that question. Oh, I do apologise. Yes, yes, we have. Um, right. Um, you've got predictive analytics for LNG, but can you give us a sense of other commodities you'll be tracking in the future? And that's also repeated by uh, someone else who's asked a very similar question. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, so the, the goal of what we're working on is obviously to spin this out to uh, all bulk commodities. Uh, so uh, the LNG fleet was the first address because it is the simplest problem. Uh, the network uh, is approximately 130 uh, facilities uh, and the fleet, as I said before, is less than 400 ships. Um, therefore, the, the, the in, ter in terms of the, of the probability that a vessel may do any one of a number of things, the, the, the size of this tree is, is, is relatively small. Uh, our next, our next um, product will almost certainly be in coal, but we are going to work in iron ore, grain, uh, and of course, uh, we will intend to work in crude oil and uh, LPG. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, I've got another one here for you. Um, what is the lower limit for the predictions accuracy, i.e., do the algorithms only display routes with, for example, a 95% certainty, or is there something else? Uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, not quite sure I get the question uh, entirely. Um, however, uh, when, when a vessel is in a particular point at sea, uh, it has a full range of potential probabilities available to it. And as additional information becomes available from, uh, obviously, AIS uh, capture, uh, we're able to adjust the, uh, the probabilities accordingly for any one of these future events to take place, uh, or indeed to have taken place in the past. Um, there are no limits, uh, so to speak, in terms of how this is done. We're not trying, we, we don't do anything magical. We have no additional information beyond uh, the combined transmissions from the vessels, um, but our goal is to m is produce the best possible analysis uh, of this information. I hope that answers the question. I wasn't quite clear on it. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Um, Adam, uh, one for you here. How often do you receive an AIS message? So when we look at the, the two different systems, when we look at our terrestrial network, the signal has been sent out by the vessel every two to ten seconds. Let's say we capture that information. So we can replay that uh, either historically or, or live um, through our uh, website. Um, when we're looking at the fusion of the two with the, the 
a satellite derived information we capture information and, and put information out every 15 minutes as long as those vessels are under coverage of the uh, constellation of satellites so it's depending on what granular level you, you want to go down to we can either stream uh, data in real time literally like turning on a tap as soon as we get the information it, it streams straight out and there is just a, a matter of seconds with regards to the latency on that data or we can filter out that information as we said earlier so that you only get the, the right information um, and we take away all the noise that you don't want to see and update that on the frequency that is up to yourself. So whether that be every 15 minutes, every hour, every day, um, as I say, we capture the information live and can output it in that way if required. Okay, thanks, Adam. There's a, a couple of linked questions here. Um, one is, are there any restrictions on what vessels I can see in your system? And there's another uh, question here is what is the smallest size of vessel that is captured in terms of dead weight of the vessels seen? Okay, so the IMO regulation uh, states that it's all vessels from 300 gross tons and above uh, have to have an, an AIS uh, transponder on board. Having said that, uh, we also pick up uh, other smaller vessels like barges as well, especially in the ARA region. So there is no real rule of thumb as such, um, but as I say, from a, a legal standpoint, it's vessels from 300 gross tons, but we do see smaller vessels. As long as they have a class A transponder, uh, we're able to pick that information up and rebroadcast that to, to yourselves. Um, uh, thank you very much, Adam. Um, again, another couple of linked questions. Um, one is, how does the LNG product uh, ascertain quantity of cargo loaded? Um, and then there's another question here. Do you know how much cargo is being carried on the vessels? Matt. Thanks, Simon. Um, yes, we don't just assume the vessel is either fully laden or uh, fully uh, empty. Um, it's more complex than that. We are able to make estimations as to uh, the, the, the percentage laden of any particular uh, boat. We look at a whole number of factors, uh, again, uh, to, to calculate this, including uh, time spent at birth uh, and, of course, supporting data on the statistically, uh, statistically derived loading times and discharge times at the birth and, indeed, uh, by the individual vessel. Uh, we look at, obviously, load line restrictions around the world, etc. Um, uh, and and the, w doing this, we're able to then turn out uh, the idea that a vessel uh, is, you know, partially laden as, or, or perhaps just carrying a heel of cargo, if, if indeed ballasting. Uh, it obviously becomes more complex um, if you have um, a more complex potential solution for the vessel. These are only estimations. We will always assume that the vessel will attempt to load to uh, maximum capacity, um, and we'll be able to put these limits uh, around what it actually physically could have done based on the signals uh, and obviously provide them to our um, subscribers. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, right, there's another one here for Adam. Um, you, you state you have the best AIS data on the market. Why? Okay. <laughs> Very direct question there. Okay, so the reason we've got the best data is the size of our network and, the, and our ability to push that information out to our clients. Um, going back to the presentation we spoke about India, we saw there was a big gap in the market. So we proactively went out to see where are our gaps in our AIS network and made sure that they were filled through feedback with our clients as well. So, you know, where we thought we needed uh, additional coverage, we did go to our client base, say, look, we see that there is a, a potential area of development. Would this be of interest to you? And through the Genscape uh, team, we were able to expand our coverage in these very high areas of interest for our clients. And the other main reason I'd say we, we are the best is through our uh, relationship with Exact Earth. Now, as I say, at the moment, Exact Earth have five satellites in their constellation, and they will be growing those uh, to seven in 2014. We're not 
reliant on what we've got today, we are growing, expanding our network on a month by month basis. So the fact that we've got the best today, we're not just relying on that. We will continue to grow so that we remain to be the best AIS provider in the marketplace from now going forward. I hope that covers the question. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Adam. Uh, here's a leading one for you, Matt. When can we expect the iron ore and grain predictive analysis to be rolled out? Um, thanks, Simon. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, as I said before, we've concentrated um, on perfecting what we're doing, and uh, indeed still perfecting what we're doing in uh, the LNG world. It, it is, a, it is a, a, a substantial problem, a really non-trivial problem to get this right uh, based on the information that is available. Um, However, the, 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 the system really wants, wants working properly. Uh, the, substantially the same technology will be used with some, admittedly, some variations for uh, the dry bulk fleet or uh, the t various tanker fleets, etc. So we would, expect, uh, we would expect this to be sometime, hopefully, relatively early next year. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Matt. Um, another one for you, Matt. Um, how do your customers receive these insights that you were talking about? Do you have, do you have a dashboard or, or a query reporting tool? Thanks, Simon. Um, at the moment, we have a uh, web-based uh, a web-based dashboard, I suppose you could call it. So you can um, you can enter the system, the application, and you can look at some aggregates if you wish. You can look at terminal level aggregates. You can look at regional flows, or you can look right down to individual vessels and produce their entire operational history and map it. Um, that's again irrespective of whether they were seen, they went missing for three or four weeks or or not. Um, so that's that's one way. The other way is to provide raw raw data. So we can provide our I think as I discussed in my presentation, our, our kind of base level of data is this idea of a voyage for every vessel rather than a position. Uh, so we can provide this information in, in, um, in a CSV file, which will basically have a obviously identifier for a vessel, a, a start point and end point for every voyage in, in the history we've calculated. Uh, obviously the various times involved, the cargoes carried, the percentage laden, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they're the two ways at the moment. Uh, potentially there are, there are a few other ways, uh, potentially email reporting, um, uh, could come out in the next few weeks, um, but it hasn't been finalized yet. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, uh, there's a couple of uh, related questions here for you, Adam. Um, one is, can I put the data onto my GIS platform? And secondly, uh, how can I customize my own data feed? Okay, so the answer to the first question is absolutely yes. Um, the way that the data is formatted is it has its, all the data is time stamped and it has uh, latitude and longitude. So in any GIS platform, you can easily absorb that data into and then uh, overlay it with other intelligence that you may have. Um, how can you customize your feed? Tell us what you want to see, tell us how you want it, and we can produce that. Um, I've never known um, ourselves not to be able to cut the data in a way that our client wanted to see it. So as I said earlier, if they want to see an individual vessel, that's fine. We can output an individual vessel. Um, the best method for uh, consuming that data is through web services, because then that gives you the ability to swap in and out tonnage uh, as you require. Um, so it, it's a very simple process, um, that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you tell us what you want to see and then we work to, towards that vision. Simon. Okay, uh, right, well I, uh, to be honest, uh, all I can say at this stage is thank you so much for the registration and uh, your clear engagement in this webinar, um, clearly evidenced by the vast number of questions we generated. I, I'm sorry if we didn't have sufficient time to respond to your particular question, um, but uh, I assure you we'll get back to everyone and address them all in the next, uh, well, as soon as possible. Um, so just before we go, can I please remind you that free trials and expert demonstrations are available for both the Genscape Vessel Tracker and the Commodity Vector LNG products. Please uh, have a look at our Genscape website, uh, website for details. Finally, 
to help us improve our webinars in the future, can I please encourage you to complete the very short questionnaire after we close. Again, we sincerely thank you for your interest, and uh, it's goodbye from myself, Adam, and Matt. <laughs>